number one i am going to update you on what has changed that you are probably not aware of um which is fine uh, by the time we are done with this session you should know what has changed with respect to tax laws with respect to the tax landscape of ghana and this will arm you with a lot of very relevant information as you enter your exam hall update number one is there was a court case decided at the end of 2019 between a certain Kwesi Nyantichi Oredu, who is actually a tax consultant himself, and the Ghana Revenue Authority. So he took the Commissioner General of Ghana Revenue Authority to court, really. He took the GRA to court, and his case was simple. If you are aware, the Income Tax Act provides for something called mortgage interest deduction. What the law says is that if you have a mortgage and that mortgage relates to a single residential premises for your entire lifetime, you are allowed a deduction of that mortgage interest in arriving at your assessable income or your chargeable income for a year of assessment. GRA was holding that taxpayers could only deduct this mortgage interest at the end of the year. But Kwesi Nyantechi wanted to get a monthly deduction, so he took GRA to court. Long story short, the court ruled in favor of Kwesi Nyantechi Oredu that mortgage interest deductions can now be taken on a monthly basis. What does this mean for you as you are sitting your exam? If there is a question, and I think I've seen one in a recent setting, I think it was level three, and that advanced tax paper. If there's a question where they give you information about mortgage interest deduction, take note, watch it carefully and see if you will have to take this monthly deduction, check to see if there is any information given that is trying to test to see if you are aware of this change in um, practice. So what this means is that in practice, you are required to provide to your employer proof of the mortgage so this will mean get the mortgage statement from the mortgage provider and provide this to your employer who will grant you this deduction from payroll on a monthly basis. Another way an examiner could test this could be in a theory question or in a written question. They could ask you what was the ruling or what was held in the Kwesinian Techi case. This is particularly relevant for those in level three. I will be surprised if the examiner level two wants to test this, but you never know. Who want to surprise you on exam day. So take note, this is what has changed. Mortgage interest deductions are now on a monthly basis because of this court case. Next thing you need to know is that you know our pension scheme in Ghana is a three-tier system. We have the tier one and tier two, which are both mandatory schemes, and then we have tier three, which is what a voluntary scheme. Um, our next session, day two, we will look at um the pension schemes in addition to employment income taxation. So if you want to learn about in-depth employment income taxation, social security, pensions, everything, look at past questions, join us on Sunday, same time, 6 p.m., and we will take a look at that. But back to this update, because of COVID-19, something changed with respect to the tier three taxes. Now, if you withdrew your tier three um, pension benefits, there was a tax that applied. So what the law says was, if you withdraw from your tier three, if you're in the formal sector before 10 years and before retirement, if you're in the informal sector before five years and before retirement, then you would have been subject to a withholding tax of 15% on that withdrawal. What COVID-19 has done is that withdrawals from the tier three, as a result of COVID-19, either you have lost your job or because you need funds due to the pandemic that's for the self-employed persons then you will not be subject to the 15 percent tax what this means is because of COVID-19 if you lose your job and you need to access your tier, tier 3 funds even before the mandatory date that is 10 years for the formal sector and five for the informal sector the law has been amended so the income tax act was actually amended to effect this there is um, an exemption on such withdrawals. Take note of this. It will be particularly relevant in employment income tax questions, and they could test this really as part of the um, written questions. Next, very, very, very important um, update that will matter for both level two and level three candidates is 
there's something now called an independent tax appeals board if you have watched our video on tax administration we have covered this into a lot more detail but for those who haven't let's say this is your first time joining us here there is an independent tax appeals board so act 1029 of 2020 amended the revenue administration act of 2016 act 915 and that did one particular thing what it did was it introduced an independent tax appeals board to hear objection cases now those who may not have been aware of the old process if the commissioner general issues an assessment and you do not agree with him you are required to pay a deposit so if it is a tax that is not customs related you deposit what 30 percent if it's a customs or import related tax you have to pay what 100 percent of the amount what in dispute but let's forget about that after you object if you were not in agreement with the commissioner general you had to what proceed to court under the old system so you would have gone to the high court then if you don't agree with the high court you can go to the appeal court or the way to supreme court but long story with the introduction of the independent tax appeals board if the commissioner general after you object he tells you he doesn't agree to your objection and you want to still follow this case and fight you don't go straight to court you have to now go to the independent tax appeals board and then if you win the case at the independent tax appeals board then you can end it there but if you still lose the case at the independent tax appeals board that is when you can decide to go to court so just take note that we now have some form of a tribunal system in ghana to hear tax dispute cases after the commissioner general rejects your objection you don't go straight to court you now have to go to the independent tax appeals board before if you don't win the case there you can choose to go to court why am i mentioning this this is particularly relevant in questions on tax administration anytime the examiner examines a question on dispute resolution procedures which is a constant feature in tax exams actually what i've seen is if it doesn't come in level two it will come in level three so just know that this is something you should be looking out for if they choose to test you on this just know that the objection process has changed what else should you know with respect to this in the 2021 budget um the minister who read the budget said that they plan to empanel these people so they are planning to set up the appeals board sometime this year so it will become fully functional before end of year hopefully so just note that this is actually happening in practice what else should you know communication service tax or cst the rate has changed so effective 15 september 2020 the cst rate dropped from nine percent to five percent this will be relevant for both level two and level three candidates take note of this in questions on cst you need to apply five percent and not nine percent remember this what else should you know the gra structure has changed and i bet your examiner will want to examine this this particular system if he doesn't i'll be surprised now i'm sure all of you are aware that a gra used to be organized along the lines or to be more specific the domestic tax revenue division of the gra was organized along the lines of what large taxpayer office medium taxpayer offices and then small taxpayer offices so we have to call them ltos mtos and what stos once again these have been comprehensively covered in our tax administration series of videos but not to worry if you haven't what has changed here is that the gra has done away with the categorization of medium taxpayer offices and small taxpayer offices so those of you who have been observant i'm sure you've seen when you are driving by you're walking around in the gra office you probably see the sign post now says taxpayer service center instead of what medium taxpayer office or small taxpayer office so what has changed how much you know the large taxpayer office remains it hasn't changed however the medium taxpayer offices and the small taxpayer offices have been converted into two different categories so we now have area offices and we now have taxpayer service centers um, approximately there are roughly 10 area offices in ghana now and then there are other taxpayer service centers however the, the GRA has stated that the lto even though will be in accra there will be an lto desk 
at each tax or at major cities that um, have a significant number of large taxpayers located there. So you can find an LTO desk in some of these taxpayer service centers. Why must you know this? In questions on tax administration, that will be asking things like talk about the structure of the GRA or how is the GRA organized. Please remember, don't go quoting large taxpayer office, medium taxpayer office and small taxpayer office. Yes, your past question may give that as the answer, but that has changed and your examiner will be expecting up to date answers. What else must you know? This is particularly relevant for those in level three advanced tax. It has to do with transfer pricing. What must you know under transfer pricing? I'm sure you saw in, I'm sure it was last sitting on the one before, they asked a the question on transfer pricing. It was on the transfer pricing methods, like comparable uncontrolled price, transactional net margin approach, and all of those things, right? But what must you know here? The law regarding transfer pricing has changed in Ghana. So the old 2012 legislative instrument, the transfer pricing regulations of 2012 LI 22188 has been repealed and replaced by the new 2020 transfer price regulations, LI2412. So just note, LI2412 brings a number of significant changes to Ghana's transfer pricing um, regime or transfer pricing landscape. We are not going to bore those who are not interested in this with the details, but just note that the law regarding transfer pricing has changed. Even this has brought new filing requirements, such as what filing something called a master file, a local file, and even requirements around country by country reporting. But let's not bore you with the details. What else has changed over here? With respect to the double taxation agreements Ghana has signed with other territories, take note that the Ghana Czech Republic double taxation agreements became effective 1st January 2021. That's this year. So in your exam, just take note if there's a question with the other person in um, Czech Republic, just know that we now have an active double tax agreement with them. Or in those questions where they ask you to list countries with which Ghana has a DTA or a DTT double tax treaty, remember that you can now add Czech Republic to the list of those countries because the DTA is now effective. It's, it's now in force. We are using it in practice. What else should you know? COVID-19 donations you make are designated as allowable deductions. So if you are doing your um, company income tax assessment or your business income tax assessment, where they give you a company's account, you are doing an examination of accounts, you are adding back expenses that are to be disallowed. Remember that usually you would have disallowed donations, right? Donations that were not to a worthwhile cause or donations that were not appropriately approved, you would have disallowed them. Take note that in practice, COVID-19 related donations are designated under Section 100 of the Income Tax Act of 2015 Act 896 as allowable deductions. So if your examiner decides to throw in a surprise and they see that a company or the business donated to some, um, some, some school, some hospital, whatever, it had to do with COVID-19, remember that you need to allow that deduction. Don't disallow it because... It's now been designated as an allowable deduction. So this should do it for our tax update. Obviously, so many other things change, but I'm looking at you as exam candidates. What will be relevant for you? And these are the relevant areas. Leave the rest for the practitioners to deal with, right? So these are the changes um, you need to be aware of. Let's move on to our next agenda for today, which is to look at withholding tax. So at this point, if you have any question, feel free, drop it in a question. I will respond. And um, with respect to withholding tax, what do you need to know here? Now, remember, I'm sure everybody here knows what withholding tax is. So let me not bore you with the details. Now, withholding tax mechanism, let's quickly revise the rates. Because don't forget that in the exam, ICAG does not give you a schedule of rates. Some exam bodies outside Ghana are lucky. So, for example, I know some countries, I won't mention their name. You go to your tax exam, there's a schedule at the back with all the rates you need, right? But Ghana, you're not lucky. Um, you have to memorize the rate. So, please, let's quickly refresh our memory of withholding tax rates in Ghana. Let's start with withholding tax for resident persons. So, with respect to resident persons in crash course style, let's run through the rates. So, if you make a dividend payment... Is what eight percent to a resident person you withhold at eight percent. If you make a payment for interest, 
the withholding tax rate is also what eight percent um but take note this excludes it excludes individuals and resident financial institutions right so for them if you are uh, if it's a bank a bank is paying an individual resident obviously interest they will not withhold that is why your savings account interest does not suffer withholding tax because of the exemption in section 7 of the income tax act the next is rent on properties also suffers withholding tax if it is a residential property then eight percent if it's non-residential then 15 percent right then payments for natural resource um, payments and royalties attract withholding tax of what 15 percent then fees or allowances to a resident director manager trustee or board member of a company or trust that is resident obviously the withholding tax rate is 20 percent then fees that are paid to examine uh, examiners and vigilators supervisors of examination or part-time teaching or lecturing attract withholding tax at a rate of 10 percent take notice the final tax final withholding tax and here i've seen employment income questions where they can tell you in that question that a person does some part-time teaching or part-time lecture remember that a withholding tax is 10 percent but it's a final tax so it does not go into determining the person's employment income tax for the year remember this as you are doing your employment income tax questions as well then endorsement fee payments also attract a withholding tax of 10 percent what else do we need to know when it comes to still on resident um, persons commission payments to a resident loan to receiver or agent is also 10 percent commission payments to a sales agent 10 percent commission to a resident insurance sales or canvassing agent is also at a rate of 10 percent then insurance premium with a source in ghana to a non-resident person the rate is five percent and take note here it is insurance premium payments to a non-resident person so what you need to learn here is that if you make an insurance premium payment to a resident insurance company no withholding tax will apply remember this um it's 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 key to remember then if you make payments for the supply or use of goods and the contract amount exceeds 2000 ghana cd per annum then for goods the withholding tax rate is what three percent if you make a payment for works and the value exceeds 2000 ghana cds per annum then the withholding tax rate for works will be five percent and if you make a payment for services by an entity and the service contract amount exceeds 2000 Ghana cities per annum, then you would hold on. Obviously, all of you know that service holding tax rate is what 7.5%. If you make a payment for unprocessed precious minerals, then the withholding tax rate will be what a rate of 3%. Then, if you make a payment to a petroleum subcontractor, the rate will be 7.5%. Please know these rates especially level three um advanced tax where anything is fair game at least the level two guys sometimes they don't go too hard on you but level three please know all these rates because anything is fair game at that level ensure that once the rate is on the screen you have it somewhere in your memory so this should be it for the withholding tax rates for resident persons or payments to resident persons let's now look at the withholding tax um, rates for non-resident persons so when you're making payments to persons who are non-resident for tax purposes so on non-resident persons once again um, this is this relates to employment income so if a non-resident person um, earns income from an employment in ghana that person will be subject to an employment income tax rate of 25 percent and i want to emphasize here I have seen a number of textbooks on the market that are saying this 25% rate is 20%. Let me use this avenue to correct um, this error. So in the year 2018, this changed. So there was an amendment to the Income Tax Act. The Amendment Act was Act 973. So Act 973 was passed by Parliament to amend Act 896 to increase the rate from 20% to 25%. So in 
So if you are using a textbook that is older than 28, and obviously you'll be having um, the rate of 20%. But please take note, it is no longer um, 20%. The withholding tax rate um, for non-resident persons, uh, even for unemployment, should be 25% instead. All right. Good. Now, if you make payments to a non-resident person for um, management, consulting, and technical service fee, that should be at the rate of um, 20%. Then payments for dividends will be at a rate of 8%. But take note, for dividends, there's a special um, requirement here. For example, there are, there are rates for double taxation agreements. So depending on the country you make the payments to, the rates might be lower. Um, and this is something that will be particularly relevant for those in level 3 who may have to um, deal with the interplay of double tax treaties. So, for example, even though the rate in our law is 8%, if you make a payment to someone in Germany and the person is like a beneficial owner who holds at least um, a certain proportion of the dividends, which could be in some cases 10% or 25%, um, then the, the withholding tax rate will be a lower rate of 5%. So, take note that even though the general rate in our law is 8%, for some countries, it can be what lower. So, let's say Singapore, the Ghana-Singapore double tax agreement provides for a rate of 7%. The Ghana Mauritius double tax agreement provides for a rate of what? 7%. Um, the Ghana UK double tax agreement provides for a rate of 7.5%. So just know which country you are dealing with before you decide on the dividend rate if it's a non-resident country, right? All right, let's continue. Then um, royalties, natural resource payments and rents will attract a withholding tax rate of 15%. Then endorsement fees, 20%. Then branch profit taxes. If you want to remember, just know that it has the same rate as what? Dividend, 8%, right? So the branch profit tax rate is 8%. It's applied on the deemed repatriated profit, which is equal to the um, after-tax profit of a branch. The law deems that entire amount to have been repatriated, whether or not it's actually repatriated from Ghana. Then interest income is subject to a withholding tax rate of 8%. Once again, this is subject to double tax, taxation agreement um, rate. So depending on the country, the rate for interest could be lower. So for example, if you are making a payment to Mauritius, you are making a payment to, let's say, Singapore, the rate is at a lower rate of what? 7%. Take note, even though our law provides for um, 8%, right? So this is it for non-residents we still have a few non-resident rates to go still on non-resident persons if you make payments for general insurance to a non-resident insurance company the rate is five percent remember i told you that payments to a resident insurance company insurance premium payment um, will be exempt from withholding tax if you pay to a resident insurance company payments to a petroleum subcontractor who is non-resident, please take note this 15%. So level three candidates, in particular, payments to um, a, a non-resident subcontractor should attract um, a 15% rate. And then any uh, payments for the supply of goods, works, or supply of services, where the contract gives rise to income from Ghana, withholding tax will be at a rate of 20%. Then for transport businesses, and then for telecom and e-commerce transmission businesses, the rate is 15%. Obviously, there are some additional conditions we don't need to go into at this level. So now that we have the rates out of the way, what are the essentials you need to remember when it comes to withholding tax as you prepare for your exam? First thing you need to know is that there's a threshold when it comes to goods, works, and services. The law provides for a threshold of 2,000 Ghana cities. What this means or what the law says specifically is that payments below this threshold will not suffer withholding tax, i.e. the 3% withholding tax rate for goods, the 5% withholding tax rate for works, and the 7.5% withholding tax rate for services. What does this mean in practice? However, you need to check that two or more contracts can be combined into one when it comes to determining the threshold. So let's say um, you have a contract with someone and you want to determine whether you've met a threshold. Let's say the first payment, they've not reached 2,000 cities. But over a one-year period, do you anticipate or was there actually the evidence 
that this amount had been exceeded if there was that case then you have to withhold even though the first set of payments may not reach the 2000 cities threshold we have um, a past exam question on this channel um, solved check the past exam question library you will see a question that from ICAG one past exam question on this concept that was tested and and for those who um, haven't yet seen some of our videos do want to check them out especially the ones on withholding tax it will be more comprehensive I think it's in three parts or two parts I'm not sure I've forgotten right check it out and and it covers all of these into a lot more detail next thing you need to know is withholding tax there is exemption from withholding tax for some classes of payments the first thing you need to know is that i've mentioned this already insurance premium payments made to a resident insurance company is exempt from withholding tax then payments for contracts that deal in the um, supply of goods that constitutes the trading stock of both the vendor and the purchaser would also be exempt from withholding tax and then where the commissioner general specifically exempts you in writing either by showing good cause by your past proper tax conduct or good tax record or by you specifically writing for him for application for exemption the commissioner general can also exempt you from withholding tax so these are the three main areas where withholding tax exemption will apply obviously also withholding tax will not apply to payments that are exempt from income tax that is why um if you are making a payment to let's say um, a public university that is exempt from income tax according to the income tax act you will not ordinarily withhold tax because by their very nature they are exempt from income tax what is the rule around withholding tax compliance when must you comply i'm sure all of you know this you should by the 15th day of the next month so withholding tax returns and the relevant withholding tax amount must be paid and the returns filed on or before the 15th day of the next month so transactions for january will be paid before 15 february transactions for february will be paid on or before 15th march in that order what else do you need to know under withholding taxes withholding tax certificates exist and what is the purpose of this when it comes to withholding tax certificates the rule is that a withhold a person who withholds is required to submit or issue to the person they withheld on 30 days after the month the transaction took place a withholding tax um, certificate or credit certificate that will show the amount of tax that was withheld however if it has to do with an employer employee relationship a relationship under section 114 of the income tax act then what has to happen is that the employer has to issue to the employee 30 days after the year has ended that's on the 30th of january a withholding tax um, certificate this is for cases where the employee is still employed or is still under the employ of the employer where the employee has ceased employment during the year what must happen is that the employer has to issue the certificate within 30 days after the employee has ceased employment with the employer what else do you need to know when a non when a, when a resident person enters to a contract with a non-resident person for the supply or use of goods work or services that gives rise to income in ghana they need to notify the commissioner general within 30 days of entering into the contract there are a specific details of things they need to tell the commissioner general like the name of the counterparty the amount involved the address and then the um, amount of payments to be made and all of that but please take note this has been covered extensively in our withholding tax um, video series on this um, very channel then dividend withholding tax remember i told you the dividend withholding tax rate is what eight percent however when a resident person makes a dividend pay payment to another resident person the law provides for a case where that eight percent withholding will not apply at all what is this particular case it will be in a case where if the receiving company the company that is receiving a dividend from the paying company owns at least 25 percent of the voting shares of the voting and um, power of the company that's making a payment and no withholding will apply take note this is voting shares so it should be ordinary shares it should be equity shares things like um, preference shares will not qualify remember this it has to be 25 percent or more of the voting shares of voting power um, of the paying company and in that case if you are making the payment 
withholding will not apply. I've seen multiple past exam questions at ICA where they even there was this one they gave a scenario and they said um company wanted to decide which other company to invest in. They gave them company A, company B. I think company A, they were going to own less than 25% of the shares. Company B, they were going to own more than 25% of the shares. And they asked you which of the companies should they invest in. All they were trying to test you was if you knew if if you own 25% or more of a company's voting shares, then no dividend withholding tax will apply to you. That's what the examiner was testing, really. But a lot of candidates could not answer it according to the examiner's report. So please don't be one of those candidates if you've attended this session. Despite this fact, it doesn't apply to everybody. So this exemption from withholding taxes does not apply to petroleum operations and mining or minerals and mining operations. For them, even if you own 100%, this exemption will not apply to you. You still have to withhold tax when you are making that um, payment. So this should cap our discussion on withholding taxes, our summary or high-level crash course on withholding taxes. And let's move to capital allowances next. When we are done, then we look at some past exam questions and then we can call it a day. So let's move to capital allowances. What must you know when it comes to the crash course level at a very high level? And please take note, let me issue a disclaimer. What we've covered is the very essential, very distilled um, concept there are so many things that we've not covered here. Obviously, something that we've covered in a number of full videos on our channel, we can't do that in, what, 10, 15 minutes, right? So, you should have some time. If you don't have some time, it's fine. But if you have some time and you want to still delve into a lot more detail into withholding taxes, take a look at the videos we have on this channel. I think there are, yeah, two videos. Um, take a look at those. I think it, um, they are roughly... Uh, 26 minutes each roughly like 25 26 minutes um watch them what i can guarantee you is by the time you've gone through both of them you will know everything you need to know about withholding tax so you can take that approach run through them refresh your memory about withholding tax in ghana so let's move now to capital allowances um what do you need to know here once again this is supposed to refresh your memory let you know the very important things you need to remember but like i said if you want a more detailed explanation, we've already covered this in Capital Allowance. I think it's three series plus um, solved past exam questions. So you should um, be fine. So under Capital Allowances, what, what do you need to know? Let's look at the rate of Capital Allowance. Let's refresh our memory. First thing you need to know is that there are five general pools of Capital Allowance or assets for Capital Allowance purposes. Class 1 deals with computers and data handling equipment together with their peripheral devices this is 40 percent take note on a reducing balance basis right the next is class two which deals with automobiles buses and minibuses goods vehicles construction and earth moving equipment heavy general purpose or specialized trucks trailers and trailer mounted containers um, all of these i i prefer to call them road vehicles so these are all road vehicles. They are road vehicles. That's how to remember them. And I would contrast that with what we have in class three shortly. But apart from this, one thing I want you to remember is that plant and machinery use in manufacturing will be under class two. So if your question says that the company is a manufacturing company, please take note. That all plants and machinery will be in class two. This is one thing the examiner catches a lot of students' pants down. They do not pick up the fact that the company is a manufacturing company and so their plants should be in class two. If you miss them, put it in class three, you are screwed big time. So please and please again ensure that when the question, in fact, in tax, every word matters. So if the examiner says the company is a manufacturing company, take note that their plants and machinery will be in class two. What is the rate for class two assets? It's at a rate of 30% on a reducing balance basis. All right, now let's look at class three assets. Class three assets are, remember I told you class two are for the road vehicles, right? So class three will be things like railroad cars, locomotives and equipment, vessels, barges, tags, and similar water transport equipment. That's on the water or on, on water. 
aircraft is in the air, specialized public utility plant, equipment and machinery, office furniture, fixtures and equipment, and then any depreciable asset not included in another class. So class three is called the general pool. The general pool. I always say if you are not sure where to put something, put it in class three <laughs> as a joke, right? Obviously. But yeah, so you can see that the road vehicles are in class two, like the buses, the mini buses, the vehicles, the trucks, the things that move on land really are in class two. Class three are for railroad equipment, ships, vessels, locomotives, aircraft, things that don't move on land are in class three. That's why you can use to remember. Then apart from those types of vehicles, um, general things like your furniture and fittings, your office equipment and stuff will be in class three. And that is why I told you it's important, very key, that the plant and machinery used in manufacturing right here, if the question says manufacturing company, then the plant is class two. If the question doesn't say manufacturing company, then the same plant will be found in what? In class three. Take note of this, right? So I don't mix it up. Class three is 20% on a reducing balance basis. Class four is for buildings, structures, and works of a permanent nature. And these are 10% on, take note, straight line basis. So class one is reducing balance, class two reducing balance, class three reducing balance. So you can learn that one, two, three, reducing balance. Four, five, straight line, right? If you, have, you can develop something to remember. One, two, three, reducing balance. Four, five, straight line. So class four is on a straight line basis. And please, we've explained what this means with a lot more details in all our capital allowance videos. So if you want a lot more details, please feel free to check it out. If you know it, it's fine, right? Class five is for intangible assets. And this is, um, we use a useful life of the intangible asset as the depreciation base, obviously to end up being a straight line method, right? So this is it for the rates of capital allowance. Now let's move to the specialized industries, i.e. the petroleum and mining industry. For them, they have very similar capital allowance rules. So for separate petroleum operations, it's 20%. On a straight line basis for separate mining operations is also 20 percent on a straight line basis so for them they kind of like pull all their assets into one pool and grant capital allowance at a rate of 20 percent straight line i.e ends up being um a five-year capital allowance right off when it comes to these types of entities right okay now that we know the rates what are the essentials we all need to be aware of? What are the essential elements of capital allowance that you need to take home um, before we start looking at the past exam questions? So here, the law gives us a formula for computing capital allowance. It can be found in the third schedule of Act 896. It says the capital allowance is A times B times C over 365. And it tells us clearly so where A is the depreciable basis of the pool of assets, so if it has to do a class 1, class 2, class 3, whatever, then A is the depreciable basis of that pool. B will be the rate of depreciation of capital allowance, which we spoke about shortly. I mean, that's 40, 30%, 20%, whatever the rate is. And C is the number of days in the basis period of the person. Please take note, C is not when you bought the asset. So the examiner will tell you clearly. People confuse this. Um, with, with the number of days in the basis period. So C only matters in the year of commencement or cessation, right? So C will only matter in what? In the year of commencement or what? When you cease um, operations or when you, you end business. So do not mix C with the date you bought the assets is when you started business or um seize business we have um, a question on capital allowance we'll add more um shortly but for now um i think that there's a there's a number of yeah there's one on the channel check it out it will take you through um a question where you had to look at the dates when the assets were purchased and we had to ignore all of that i think this they started business that year take a look at that one it should give you some practical example if you know this already perfect fair enough don't bother right Next thing we need to know is that what is the minimum depreciation basis amount that is allowable? So the law provides that where the 
depreciation base of a pool at any time falls below 500 Ghana cities um, at the end of the year, you are required to grant an additional capital allowance to reduce the pool value to zero. So let's say you've done your capital allowance computation. You realize that the pool balance is 498 Ghana cities. What we are saying is don't bother leaving 498 as the written down value carry forward of a pool. Give them an extra capital allowance of 498 to reduce their pool balance to zero. So take note, your pool balance cannot be less than what 500 Ghana cities. That is a minimum pool balance rule, as I choose to call it. What else do you need to know? When it comes to motor vehicles, there's a restriction here. What do I mean by a restriction? So there's an amount of 75,000 Ghana cities. So if the question tells you that the company purchased motor vehicles during the year, remember that you cannot capitalize more than 75,000 based on a certain condition I'll tell you shortly. So the general rule is there's a restriction, but some, um, some motor vehicles are exempt from this. Which motor vehicles are these? If it's a commercial vehicle within the meaning of the Income Tax Act, then no, I mean, this 75,000 will not apply. So if it passes this test, even if it's 2 million CDs, you add it to class 2 and you grant capital allowance accordingly. What are commercial vehicles within the meaning of the law? It is not what you think. Any vehicle that can carry a load of more than half a ton or can carry more than 13 passengers is deemed to be a commercial vehicle or any vehicle that is used in a vehicle rental business is also deemed as a commercial vehicle so vehicles that can carry a load of more than half a ton vehicles that can carry more than 13 passengers and vehicles that are used in a vehicle rental business are commercial vehicles and for them the seventy-five thousand restriction rule will not apply to them for these vehicles, even though, like I said, even if it's 2 million CDs, 10 million CDs, you will capitalize and grant capital allowance in class 2 accordingly. But if it doesn't meet these criteria, if you buy like a Camry, a Corolla, all those saloon cars will not qualify. They are not within the meaning of this. So if you buy a Corolla for 100,000, you can only get up to 75,000 CDs as a cost to be granted capital allowance on. What else must you know? For capital allowance, please practice, practice, practice. Solve a lot of questions. Practice, practice, practice. The more you practice, the more you see all the tricks, right? I can guarantee if you do um, five comprehensive past questions on capital allowance, you'll see all there is to see. There isn't too much they can do when it comes to capital allowance. The rules are fixed, right? They are, the rules are based, uh, based on law. So if you do enough questions, you will see a lot of trends. So practice, practice, practice. And my recommendation is make sure you still practice some more so now that we have done high level overview of the crash course let's now ease seamlessly into the past questions i'm going to take a number of past questions let's solve these past questions and then let's try and apply the principles let me show you some things to look out for as you are solving the past question as usual please leave a question type a comment if you don't have, um, understand anything if you have any question and um, respond appropriately. So let's start the past questions now. So let's take a look at a few past questions um, from the ICAG exam, um, both level two and level three. The purpose of these questions will be to show you um, how these topics are examined, and most importantly, the mindset with which you must attempt these questions to ensure success in the exam. So you realize that I've, for some questions here, um, give me a second. For some questions here, you see I've, I've written adapted, right? So I have attempted to take old questions that you probably don't have current solutions for and have solved them using um, solutions based on the new um, or current laws that we have in Ghana. So that should give you a lot more value in your revision. So let's start with the questions. Question one is on withholding tax. And this is something I mentioned when I was doing the updates or I was doing the overview of withholding tax. I hope you caught it. But if you didn't, it's fine. Let's take a look at this. So question one is saying, this is from the May 2020 um, exam setting. It was a level two principles of stack and of tax paper from question 2E. And the requirement said you need to determine the taxes payable, if any, and comment. On the treatment of dividend anytime you see and 
it means you need to split the question into two. There are two different requirements. So this is an exam technique you need to learn when it comes to answering exam questions. When you see the word and, it means the question is in two parts really, and you need to answer both parts in order to score the full five marks. So first thing is determine the taxes payable, if any, and then you comment on the treatment of dividend um, to the company. So take note of this one. You see, and you need to break the question into two. So here, Zillow Limited is a car battery dealer and they hold 26% voting power. Who can tell me what this question will be on? Type your answer in the comments quickly, anyone? Very simple question, right? Once you see um, voting power greater than 25%, remember I told you when we're doing the um, exemptions from withholding tax, I said, if the company receiving the dividend payment owns more than 25% of the voting shares or of the voting power of the company paying the dividend, then that dividend will be exempt from the requirement of withholding at 8%, right? So there'll be exemption from withholding tax. That is all this question is testing for a good five marks. That's all. If you don't know that provision, you don't know how to answer this. So it goes to show that for tax, you need to know your stuff. And how do you know your stuff? It's really a few things you need to cover. And like I, I keep saying, our withholding tax videos cover literally every single thing you need to know to know everything when it comes to withholding taxes. So take a look at that if you haven't, so that at least you are safe, you know what you've covered and what you need to look at before you sit the exam. So Zillow Limited, a car battery dealer, holds 26% voting power of, I don't know how to pronounce this, whatever, AB, a boy or a boy limited, an energy and power distribution company both companies are resident in ghana this is very important they are both resident so if one was non-resident then this will not apply both of them are resident in ghana then a boy limited declared dividend and the portion of dividend that should be credited to the account of zero limited is seventy eight thousand nine hundred. so determine the taxes payable if any and comment on the treatment of zero um, of dividend to zero limited so all we'll do here, let's break the question into two parts. So this was question 2E. So if it was the exam, I'll just write my question 2E, right? Then I'll say um, payment of dividend to who? Zelo limited right good so here what you need to state first is this payment of dividend the amount was what seventy eight thousand nine hundred would ordinarily have been subject to a withholding tax at the rate of 8%. However, this will not apply, so you can emphasize your not like as I'm not no, I'm not saying use yellow, but um, emphasize your notes. However, this will not apply in this particular case. The reasons for this, so many reasons, the reason, right? So the reason for this is stated below then i come and say no need to code the section i mean if you want to flex you can say section 59.3 of act 896 but yo don't go and stress yourself there so just say the income tax act you can remember just add 2015 act 896 for those who can really remember just say section 59.3 but it's better to not um, quote and go and quote wrong. I mean, don't go and quote the wrong section. So don't go and say 
57.3 was 59 subsection 3 right so don't bother just say um the income tax act 2015 at 896 provides that a dividend paid to a resident company by another resident company is exempt from tax where the company that received the dividend controls indirectly or directly at least 25% of the voting power of the company that paid the dividend so you've made your point right so now let's apply this rule to the question so we say following from the above provision in act 896 let's come here zero limited holds 26 percent of the power of what a boy limited so a boy paid um zero so following from the above provisional 896 um we say since zero limited holds 26 percent we're going to say into brackets which is greater than 25 percent right of the voting power of a boyer limited then the dividend paid by a boy limited to zero limited will not attract the dividend withholding tax so pretty much you're done really right they're saying determine the taxes payable which we did here by saying that um, the payment of dividend would have been subject to tax right at the eight rate of eight percent however this will not apply so we've said that there's no tax so we've answered this first part here determine the tax payable we said what well, it will not apply and then they said comment on the treatment of dividend we've commented by saying the income tax provides a dividend paid to a resident company by another resident company is exempt where the person that receives a dividend controls at least 25 percent or more of the voting power then we came to apply to the question by saying that zero limited holds 26 percent and we confirmed by saying that is greater than what the law says of 25 so they qualify right of the voting power of a boy limited then the dividend paid by a boy to zero will not attract the dividend withholding tax if you can do this you have um how many marks five marks um on the exam very simple right let's move on to the next question let's try and run through these so take note of this it goes to show it goes to emphasize that in tax you need to know the principles i keep saying tax is the easiest paper in level two well it's competing with um i think it's audit and assurance two very easy papers but i think tax is easier because with tax once you know your stuff no one can take it away from you 
it's not like management accounting where they can twist and turn things and try to trick you here in tax for example this rule if you don't know this you don't know it end of story right but if you know this 25 percent exemption for dividend no matter how they twisted this question you would have answered it did you get it so please in tax ensure that you know your stuff um obviously if you are too close to the exam which we are we are literally like what two weeks away or less um at this stage or even three weeks i don't know just ensure that you are in good shape by brushing up on the principles so get some time go through the core principles and then apply them to past questions and then you will pass your exam um assuredly right okay so if you stick with us to the last day i'll give you some tips on how to answer exam questions so on day seven um we'll talk about exam tips exam techniques and all of those things right? so don't worry so let's do question two right what does question two say I brought question two in for a purpose. We are not going to bother solving it, but it's to teach you something. Remember when we, when we started today, I spoke about the 2020 tax update and I said that a number of things had changed. Let's read question two together and I'll show you. This appeared in the May 2019 exam. This time it wasn't level two. It was level three, final level. Back then when they used to call it taxation and fiscal policy, right? The syllabus right before this current one what did they say required they said what purpose does this segmentation seek to achieve and it was for four marks right so the question here was as part of efficient tax administration taxpayers have been segmented into large taxpayers medium taxpayers and small taxpayers by the ghana revenue authority in the view of tax reformers Taxpayer segmentation is the way to go in order to grow revenue. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why I brought this question is remember I told you that GRA has done away with the classification of what taxpayers into large taxpayer offices, medium taxpayer offices, and small taxpayer offices. If you remember, I said we have large taxpayer offices still, but now we have what area offices and taxpayer service centers, right? So you won't be seeing this question going forward. If you are solving past questions and you go through the past years, please don't read this question and go and read the solution and learn the solution. No, things have changed. So the purpose of bringing this here was to show you number one, that things have changed. Number two is that the examiner could take this particular question and rephrase it to suit the new categorizations. So what could they ask you? Here, they could say, the GRA has changed its classification of, so I'm predicting it may come, it may not come. I'm not an examiner. But like, they could say something like the GRA has reorganized its classification of what tax offices from the previous system of large taxpayer offices, medium taxpayer offices, and small taxpayer offices. Full stop. Um, explain or write short notes on or what are the new classification systems or how are taxpayer offices now classified or how are taxpayers classified for the purpose of tax administration in Ghana effective 2020 something like that then you will answer and say this is the new classification or they could say um, the GRA has now reorganized its tax offices into what um, large taxpayer offices area offices and taxpayer service centers um, give what three benefits of this new move or what was the objective of this change like think about those areas right those are all possible questions your examiner could show um, or could throw up to you on the exam day but just to aid you when it comes to generating answers to such a question just know that the purpose of that like the GRA said in their um uh the announcement they made the documents they, they published is really to ensure that you know um Taxation has really four canons or four main canons. So economy, equity, certainty, and what convenience. So the convenience canon of taxation is what this achieves because it brings taxpayers closer to the tax administrator. In the past, if your tax office was um, a dental small taxpayer office, it means you had to, if you were in Accra, you were in Kaswa, and you were um, about to... Let's say it was 3 p.m. You had to file a return on the deadline day. You had to leave Kaswa all the way to Adenta to file a return. That was when we had those categorizations. But with taxpayer service centers, what the GRA seeks to do is that even though your office used to be Adenta 
um, small taxpayer office, which will now be called what? Adenta Taxpayer Service Center. You can file a return at Legon Taxpayer Service Center or um, Kaneshi Taxpayer Service Center, depending on where you are. Do you get it? So the point is to what? Improve taxpayer convenience, right? That's one thing you could think about when it comes to generating answers. So take note, I brought this here to show you that the updates are live. Um, and let's see whether the examiner tests this in May or in November. But I can guarantee for sure that we should see it sometime either in level two or level three on the new taxpayer um, classification. Take note of this. It's quite very, very, very important. Let's look at the next question, which is on capital allowances. This appeared in level three, final level of the May 2017 paper. And you can see I've written here adapted. And I, I, I did this because this question is pure gold. It has something on capital allowance for goodwill which has not been tested in a long while since this appeared. And I feel if the examiner chooses to bring this up again, a lot of students will be in trouble. So I thought it was right to go back, bring this topic, and then let's all solve it together, right? So um, it was based, it was in 2015, so the law was just about to change. So I'm, I, I'm saying adapted because I'm going to solve it assuming it was what the income tax as the new act we are using now. Did you get it? So let's start. As usual, Let's read the preamble and then we read the requirement. So, um, Sakote Limited, a trading company, has the following extracts from its financial records. Good, fair enough. Let's check the requirement. Um, required is calculate the amount of capital allowance. Good. Claimable for 2016 year of assessment. It's for seven marks. And then the next requirement is what? Sakote Limited paid for goodwill. And please pay attention here. You probably didn't know this. If you did, it's fine. Congratulations to you. Amounting to 10,000 cities in 2016 and intends to grant capital allowance on the value of the goodwill. Explain whether or not this arrangement is in accordance with the tax laws. And this will give you three marks. If you could do this, you get a cool 10 marks um, that will go a long way to save your life, I guess. Right. So let's do this. Um, particular question and let's see what we can glean from this particular piece of information okay so let's go and read the question so Sakote limited is a trading company and they are giving us a number of extracts from the financial records so they are saying they bought a 4 by 4 vehicle for an amount of 225,000 cities in the year 2015 and once again take note the Income Tax Act of 2015, Act 896, that we are using today, even though it was passed in 2015, it became effective on 1st January 2016. So technically, if I was to put on my tax consultant hat, I would say, well, this is a 2015 transaction. So I would have applied the old Internal Revenue Act of 2000, Act 592. But like, yo, let's make life easy for everybody here. So we are going to assume that the Income Tax Act, the new one we are using now, is what was enforced back then. Just so that everybody's life is easy. Because anyways, if this question appears today, you need to use the new law, right? And it's important because Act 592 had an extra class for capital allowance purposes. It had six. Whereas the new one had what? Or has five. So let's just use a new one so that we're on the same page. So it's an adapted question. Take note of this. All right. So um, good. In the year 2015, the cost of the vehicle was limited to an amount of 75,000 cities for capital allowance purposes in 2015. If you remember, I told you that for class two pools of assets, we just did this um, at the beginning of today's session under capital allowance. So for class two pools of assets, okay, class two pool of assets, when you buy a motor vehicle and that motor vehicle is not a commercial vehicle, then that amount will be limited, will be capped, will be restricted at 75,000 Ghana cities. And I defined commercial vehicle. If you remember, I said it's any vehicle that can carry what, more than half a ton or can carry more than 13 passengers or a vehicle using what's in a vehicle rental business. So please remember all of these very important things. So here... We are assuming the question has even told us that they limited it to 75,000. So good news, fair enough. What must you know? Let's classify 
this asset a vehicle will be what this is a class two asset so we know we'll place it in class two right good it also puts up a building at a cost of 150,000 buildings are in class what four remember class four is what buildings structures and works of what is permanent nature right so building at a cost of 150,000 cities in the same year the cost of the land was 20,000 and 130,000 for the cost of the building take note the income tax act says that land is not a depreciable asset it's the same as under IFRS, right? So IS 16, property, plants, and equipment says that what land is not depreciable. So same principle in accounting and in tax. So take note, you don't grant capital allowance on land. Just like in accounting, you don't grant depreciation on land. So we need to remove this 20,000 here and then just grant capital allowance on the 130,000 building components, all right? So that will go to class four. Then next thing is the company accordingly informed the Commissioner General about putting their assets into use and the generation of what its income in 2015. So once again, um, you when you put an asset into use and that asset is used to generate the income of your business or the business income of the entity, then you can you are entitled to what capital allowances under section 14 of Act 896. Then in the year 2016, that was the next year according to this question. It exchanged the vehicle, so there was an exchange, for four plots of land. The value of the plot of land agreed with the landowners was 220,000 cities. The exchange was deemed satisfactory to both parties and documentations were carried through. Now take note, the Income Tax Act defines realization of assets to include cases where the assets are what exchanged. So, it is not only when an asset is sold in a physical sale transaction, when you exchange an asset one for another, then that exchange is also deemed to be what a realization. So, realization is not just a um, sale. So, you realize the Income Tax Act defines realization to include so many things where the assets exchanged, surrendered, redeemed, destroyed, lost. All of those things are deemed to be what realization. When, when you lose an asset, it's been realized according to tax. So here, an exchange will qualify as realization. If it has been realized, then we need to what, reduce the pool of assets by the consideration received. If there was no consideration received, then we use the fair value or the fair market value. Here, we've been, we've been told that the value of the plots of the land agreed with the owners was 220,000. So that would, that would be what we use as consideration received for the disposal of a depreciable asset. And then, they are saying it is satisfactory to both parties and there were documentation. So let's just compute capital allowance um, for 2016 year of assessment for seven marks. Let's start. This was what's question? Um, this was from May 2017. It was question 4C. Good. So 4C. So Sakot Limited. Computation of capital allowance for the 2015 and 2016 years of assessment. Okay, and in typical capital allowance now, you know you set out your format, right? So you write your classes in a vertical format and then you work your way down. So let's start. We have um, how many classes? We've identified we have class two. So class two, class four, and then total, right? So we say written down value brought forward. Obviously, you can write up here, you know, class four, I mean, class two, if you remember, what's the rate? It's at the rate of what? 30% on a reducing balance base. Do you remember? We said it earlier today. So 30% for class two. Class four will be 10% on what? A straight line basis, right? Good. So written down value brought forward. We were not told. Um, 
Yes, so we're not told any written down value brought forward per se. It bought a four four by four vehicle turned into two hundred twenty five thousand in eighteen fifteen. The amount seventy five thousand. Yeah, and we're not told the commence business this year either, right? So we can just ignore written down value brought forward. Then additions. So they bought the vehicle for how much? Seventy five thousand. Remember. They restricted it because it wasn't a commercial vehicle. So we put here 75,000. All right. Then for the building, the building was 150,000, yes. However, land was 20,000 and only 130,000 was towards the building. So this 130,000 here is what we'll use as what the um, cost of building to be capitalized. So we put here... 130,000. All right, so we can just sum this up and get the depreciable basis. So obviously, this will be 75,000. This will be 130,000. Then we can compute what our capital allowance. So obviously, just pick 30%, which is the rate, and apply it to what 75,000. That's all. So, calculator, 30% of 75,000 will give me 22,500. So, 22,500. I'll let this to get my written down value carry forward. Then I come to class 4. Remember, class 4 is on a straight line basis. So, it's going to be what? 10% on this amount 130,000 right now clearly give me 13,000 so this is 13,000 so what's the total capital allowance for 2015 also let's write this here this is for 2015 right so how do we find capital allowance 2015 easy just add this for class 2 and this for class 3 right so 22,500 plus 13,000 will give me 35,500. Okay, so written down chi, written down value chi 4 would be the difference between um, this and this, and the difference between that and then that, right? Easy. So 75,000 minus 22,500 will give me 52,500. Then for um, the class 4, it's going to be 130,000 minus 13,000. That will give me 117,000. All right. So this is the written down value carry forward to the next year, which is 2016. So let's come to 2016. Then we say written down value brought forward. Obviously, we are continuing with the same classification to so class 2, class 4. You can just write same here, class 2, and then class 4. So our brought forward will just be the same figures. You bring this guy down, you bring this guy down, right? So brought forward will be 52,500 for class 2, and then for class um, 4 will be 117,000. Then we check where they did they have any additions during the year. Um, I don't see them add anything apart from what the 2016 here. This is what where they exchange assets. So they didn't add anything, they rather sold. So we say additions will be dash for both of them, right? Then we say what um realization. Or we can even say what disposal. What you need to you do is to bring the disposal proceeds. So they said what the value of the plots of land was what two twenty thousand. So someone might ask, but the two twenty thousand is more than my fifty two thousand here. Well, yes, but it is what it is, right? So two twenty thousand deduct the whole figure. 
and I'll show you what the law says about this shortly. Then for class four, was there any realization? No, there wasn't. So what we can do is to say dash here and then let's find the base. So let's subtract. So 52,500 minus 220,000, what would that give us? 52,500 calculator. Minus two two zero 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 will give me one sixty seven five hundred. Right, then this obviously will bring this one one seven here. Then we compute capital allowance. But I can see clearly that for class two, the balance is even negative, so you can't compute capital allowance here. I can still do for class four. Remember, I told you class four is on a straight line basis. So please, you are going to compute capital allowance on what? This original 130,000 and not this one, 17,000. Straight line means on cost. Reducing the balance, you can compute on this. But once it's straight line, you need to use what? This figure. Please remember this, right? Don't go and compute on the written down value. So it's still within percent of 130,000, which will still give us the same 13,000 here. Straight line will give you the same figure. So this will give us 13,000 as capital allowance. So it means total capital allowance for the year. Let's start the total column here. Right, so let's put total here. 2016 will be 13,000. Then our written down value carry forward for this year is dash. Then for the 2016 year of assessment class 4 it will be 117 minus 13,000. So 117000 minus 13,000. That will give me 104,000. Okay. So what did the question say? What was the requirement? They said calculate the amount of capital allowance claimable for 2016. All right. So let's write this. It's right here, 13,000. That's the answer, right? So the amount of capital allowance claimable for the 2016 year of assessment is what 13,000 CDs, right? But I'm sure you would have realized there is this negative 167,500. What should I do with it? If you have gone through our capital allowance and tuition videos, I think it's in three parts. What we said was where the um, balance of a pool is reduced. So let's say you dispose of all the assets in the pool. Then the law said you, if you remember those who have watched, there was this formula that was given. And let me use this instead. See, they have A minus B, you remember? Or B minus A. All it means is don't stress too much, right? It's essentially the consideration received less what the balance in the pool, really, at a very fundamental level. So it means that if you sell all the assets in the pool, and your consideration, which is this, is less than the what depreciable basis of the pool, then the difference you've made what a gain. This difference will be added towards your income from business, and then you'll be taxed on that. If the consideration is less than the pool balance, you'd have made what a loss, and then you'll be granted what an additional capital allowance deduction so take note here if assuming that you know here we had what the realization was two twenty thousand, right but the base was fifty two thousand five hundred. so we had the realization value of 220 greater than the fifty two five hundred. so they made a gain so this gain of 167,500 the law says that you need to include this 167,500 in their income and tax as part of what their income from business however if the consideration, let's say instead of 220 here, let's say it was 10,000, which is clearly what? Less than the written down value. 
then it means they sold it for less than it was worth. They would have made a loss. That loss they would have made would have been given as well, like an additional capital allowance deduction, really. Do you get it? So um, that's the point here. But take note, that is when all the assets in the pool have been disposed of. So let's say, um, yes, the value in the pool is um, 52500 right? But you sold everything. So there's no written down value to carry forward. You sold it for 10000 That 10000 loss would... I mean, the loss, the difference would have been um, 10000 minus 52500 That difference would be given to you as what an additional capital allowance deduction for the year. But in this case where we have what the consideration we received being greater than the depreciable basis that extra this 167500 here will be given to you as what will be added to your income and taxed appropriately so let's write a line or two for that let me clean these things here so to make our point is the first point the second point is we'll say the amount of Ghana CD what's it 167 500 will be deemed as additional income made by the company whatever the name is right this will therefore be added to their accessible business income and taxed appropriately right so that's it if you can do this you've made seven marks even though the question asks for the capital allowance if you watch it here the examiner said calculate the amount of capital allowance claimable but please you can't just comment on the thirteen thousand. this one here and then leave the 167,000. no it's not something we can forgive you for it's something that came up in your question so you need to clearly mention it in your answer okay so um before we do the one on goodwill which is this one let's test ourselves right so i'm going to ask a few questions please type your answers let's be interactive right let's be interactive so i'm going to um ask some questions please type your answer right so i'm going to write it down and then you type your answer in the comments. Don't be bothered whether it's right or wrong. You are learning. You are here to pass your exam. So I write a payment and then you tell me what the withholding tax rate is, right? So first one, take note it is being paid towards a resident person. Please just withholding tax, okay? All right. So what is the rate of withholding tax? So this for resident person for dividend payment. Dividend pay. Please write your answer in the comments. Dividend payment. What's the withholding tax rate to a resident person? Yes, let's type our answers. Dividend payment. What is the withholding tax rate? Let's make life easy for everybody, right? Let's make life easy for everybody. Is it A, 10%? Is it B, 7.5%? Or is it C, 8%? So please let's type. Um, the answer dividend payment to a resident person what is the withholding tax rate a 10 percent b 7.5 percent c 8 percent please let's type our answers in the comments yes all right the next one is so this is still to a resident person right so this is payments for unprocessed precious minerals. What is the withholding tax rate to a resident person? Is it A, 7.5%? Is it B, 3%? Or is it C, 
payment for unprocessed precious minerals to a resident person? What's the withholding tax rate? A, 7.5%, B, 3%, and C, 10%. So let's type our answers in the comments. What do you think the rate is? And don't be shy. Like I said, please type your answer. Nobody um, is going to bother reading your answer if they don't know you. Don't just type your answer, right? So let's look at the first one. Or let me even give you a last one before we look at the answers. So let's make this one on capital allowance. Capital allowance. Okay. So here, long-term crop planting costs are included in which class? Long-term crop planting costs. Is it A, class 3? Is it B, class 2, or is it C, class 5? Long-term crop planting costs. Are they class 3, are they class 2, or are they class 5? Please type your answers in the comments. Please type your answers in the comments. Please type your answers in the comments. Okay, so let's quickly go through the answers. So, the first one, easy. Dividend payment to a resident person is what? 8%. A number of you should get that right. Um, payment for unprocessed precious minerals to a resident person is 3%. Long-term crop planting costs are in class 2 right anyway so that's it let's let's continue um let's keep going so let's come back to this question here sako sako limited they said here they paid for goodwill amounting to ten thousand cities in 2016 and they intend to grant capital allowance and the value of the goodwill explain whether or not this arrangement is in accordance with the tax laws so on this one what you need to know is that goodwill right in fact, let's even start from the beginning. When it comes to capital allowance, capital allowance is granted on something called a depreciable asset. Please pay close attention, right? So if it is not a depreciable asset, you cannot get capital allowance on that asset. Simple, right? Good. When it comes to goodwill, in fact, before it comes to goodwill, the Income Tax Act in Section 133 three defines depreciable assets amongst other things in the act it states clearly that a depreciable asset is any asset that we use or that's employed in the production of income from the business right that is likely to lose value over time really it goes on to say that a depreciable asset does not include a number of things it says it doesn't include goodwill it doesn't include an interest in land remember i told you earlier we don't depreciate land we don't even grant capital allowance on land as well it doesn't include a membership interest in an entity and it doesn't include trading stock or what the accountants will call inventory right so take note Goodwill is not a depreciable asset. You can't grant capital allowance for it. Land is not a depreciable asset. You can't grant capital allowance for it. A membership interest in an entity is not a depreciable asset. You can't grant capital allowance on this. And then trading stock or inventory, according to accountants, will not be granted capital allowance. If this is the case, and goodwill, according to our law, is not a depreciable asset, this question is saying that they've paid 10,000 CDs for goodwill, right? And they want to or they intend to grant capital allowance on this. Explain whether or not this is in accordance with our law. So the answer is it's not. But like, you know you can't write it's not and get three marks. No. So you need to write something extra just a little bit. So let's how we have answered this in the exam. So this is I I. So we say 
the income tax act provides for the definition of a depreciable asset in section 133 of the act it is fine if you can remember 133 just say it provides for the definition of a depreciable asset in the act the examiner will mark you right nobody requires you to um, mention section numbers in the act it's not in the marking scheme anywhere so don't stress if you don't know it it's fine right okay so we've mentioned that the act defines um, depreciable assets then we say in the definition of depreciable assets goodwill is excluded as a depreciable asset right following from the above despite the fact that goodwill is an asset according to generally accepted accounting principles or what we call gap it will not be granted capital allowance under the third shadow of the income tax act so yeah our reason is that yes in a, in accordance with accounting or ifrs or gap goodwill is an asset we understand but our income tax act has stated clearly that it is not a depreciable asset section 14 of the act has said that capital allowance is granted with respect to depreciable assets under the third shadow so when you combine all of these provisions together it goes to show that you cannot grant capital allowance on goodwill so let's conclude we say therefore the the 10000 cities worth of goodwill will not be granted capital allowance so that's it if you can do this you get your three marks in um, this question so let's move to our next um, question which is back to withholding tax so here we are saying that is from the november 2015 um sitting level three back then final level um this is an adapted question right so in november 2015 they were still testing under the old um internal revenue act of 2000 at 592 but let's answer this question in light of the new law so what's the requirement they are saying advise the company on the withholding tax situation on payments to its suppliers this is for six marks right so advise the company on the withholding tax situation on payments to its suppliers this is for six marks all right so let's read the question why do they use these weird names okay so songe enterprise limited is a dealer in rice okay it buys its rice from the rice masters a wholesaler and then they sell to what their retailers it has not over the years deducted a withholding tax on payments to its suppliers and its management is contemplating doing so to avoid any possible sanctions from the Ghana Revenue Authority. 
it has received a letter from the Ghana Revenue Authority to conduct a tax audit on its activities. Ahead of the tax audit, the management has invited you, you watching me this evening, as a tax consultant to come and conduct a tax health check on its operations and put things right. For those who don't know what a tax health check is, really it's a form of a, a kind of like a, um, a mock tax audit conducted by anyone could be a tax consultant. So let's say you're a company, you come to me, I'm your tax consultant, you ask me to help you conduct a tax audit. What I will do is I will come to your business and then assume I'm the GRE, do a tax audit. So I'll test your um, PAYE, your payroll, test withholding taxes, compute your company income taxes, compute your VAT, and then I'll give you what your possible exposure is. So I told you that, well, if GRE were to come today, you owe this amount of tax. You've not filed your returns due on this date, so this is the penalty applicable for late filing of return. You've not paid this amount of tax, so this is the interest payable. So a health check is some form of a tax audit, but not done by the Ghana Revenue Authority, but by a consultant or even by the entity themselves in order to get a clear idea, an estimate of the potential tax exposure they have. Um, and at the end of the health check, the consultant or whoever consults or whoever does the health check issues the entity with a report, right? So that's like high level explanation of what a health check is. So let's come back to the question. So here, what we need to focus on is that they want us to what, advise the company on the withholding tax situation on their payment suppliers. If you remember when we were doing the overview at the beginning, I told you a few things, right? What did I say? I said that in cases where you make a payment and that payment constitutes what? Trading stock. Trading stock of both the vendor and the purchaser, then that trading stock will be exempt from what? Withholding tax. Do you remember? When we're doing the withholding tax exemption, I told you that what? Insurance premium payments were exempt from withholding tax if they were paid to what? A resident insurance company. I also said that if you made an application to the Commissioner General for an exemption, he would exempt you. Or if the Commissioner General has, has seen that you've shown good cause with a satisfactory tax record, he will exempt you. And then I also mentioned that supplies or contracts for the supply of what goods between a vendor and a purchaser, where those goods constitute their trading stock in common. So the vendor sells that same thing that the purchaser sells then in that case, the withholding tax on goods will be exempt. So you know the goods withholding tax would have been, what, 3% if the contract exceeds, what, 2,000 CDs per annum, right? But here, they are saying that Songe Enterprise deals in rice. They buy their rice from rice masters who also, what, a wholesaler and retailer of rice, right? So the company which is Songe enterprise sells rice they deal in rice they buy their rice from rice masters who is what a rice seller right so because both of them both the vendor which is what um rice masters and the purchaser which is Songe, both deal in rice their trading stock is rice so in that case because the vendor and purchaser have the same trading stock the three percent withholding tax on goods will not apply Take note. So that's all this question is about for six marks. They are saying advise the company on the withholding tax situation on payments to its suppliers. So here, how do we answer this particular question? It's quite simple. This is what we need to do. We need to state clearly that Songe Enterprise Limited and Rice Masters Limited both deal in rice into brackets goods. Ordinarily transactions in goods 
would have been subject to withholding tax at the rate of 3%. Next point. However, the Income Tax Act 2015 Act 896 provides that no withholding tax will apply under a contract for the supply of goods that constitutes trading stock of both the vendor and the purchaser, right? So we've said we've made the point here that contracts for the supply of goods that constitute the trading stock of both the vendor and the purchaser in this case no withholding tax will apply we've made the point let's come here we'll say since songe and rice masters both deal in rice to bracket as their trading stock it follows that the 3% withholding tax on goods will not, let's even do this, will not apply in this case. If you do this and I'm an examiner, I'll give you six marks, maybe five. There's one last point that only the prize winners will mention. One point, one more thing that only those who are going to win the prize in tax will remember to mention. I'm going to tell you what's the extra thing you need to mention here to impress and wow the examiner um, on exam day will be. So let's see. The income tax act if you want to really really flex and say in section 116 subsection 6 right provides if you don't remember it's fine don't stress okay but it's 116 subsection 6 so it's easy to remember 116 and then hot 6 right provides that Where a person is exempted from withholding tax on a supply of goods by virtue of the fact that those goods constitute trading stock of both the vendor and the purchaser that person is required to provide the Commissioner General at the end of each calendar 
quarter a list of particulars of all payments which would have attracted withholding tax if not for this special exemption if you can write this last point the examiner will have a reason to actually find a way to give you an extra mark not possible but that's what i mean literally so here it's, the point i'm making is that if you're exempted from withholding tax on the supply of goods because those goods constitute trading stock of both the vendor and the purchaser then you are required to submit to the gra at the end of every quarter so at the end of every three months right at the end of every calendar quarter that's end of every three months a list of particulars of all payments which would have attracted withholding tax if not for this exam so it means that at the end of every three months send a list of commissioner general saying that i dealt to rice masters i dealt to this guy I dealt to that guy because it was our trading stock we didn't withhold but the value of the transaction was say a million two million five hundred thousand let him know the amount or the quantity of goods you are dealing in and then let him know that okay this is the value involved he's not going to collect tax but he wants to be kept in the know he wants to know that yes you've been I'm exempted from withholding but at least it's the value potential taxes we are losing as a nation and all of that right so remember that where there is an exemption from withholding tax in the course of what sale of what well, let's say trading stock of both vendor and purchaser they are both required at the end of every calendar quarter to report to the commissioner general of all list of transactions or payments they made that they enjoyed the exemption on right so remember this is one extra principle um, to to recollect on exam day so this is it for the withholding tax um bit on it so remember this is for six marks if you could do this that's a mighty um six marks you get there so let's wrap up today with a very important thing dear to my heart which is exam technique and i'll try and emphasize this um each day of um the sessions so on exam technique if you check the channel there is this video um, with a title um, I think it's do this and you never feel a tax exam yes that one take it take some time to watch it right highly recommended but if you haven't watched it or you don't have the time no problem what are the key things that I want you to remember take away from here right I'll just summarize them I go into a lot more detail in, in those videos but here what must you remember when it comes to exam technique remember that the most important thing you need to do on exam day is number one please answer all questions i'll repeat this every day until it becomes part of us please it's important this is what i've done personally and i've never failed a professional exam so i feel these are universal truths if you can apply them it should increase your chances of passing no matter how terrible your preparation is so please answer all questions whether you know the answer or not write something that's the point i'm making yes there will be questions you probably have no idea what the answer is but still answer all questions make sure you don't leave any question untouched if there are five questions with three sub questions each answer every single one of them put something on paper if it means just writing one line two lines one paragraph for the ones you don't know you will get half a mark one mark for that one line you put there the point is you are given a chance let's say there's a big pool that pool is full of what so many hundred marks i mean all of these plenty balls right hundred your job is just pick 50 of them so pick one pick two pick three pick four pick five until you pick 50 that's how to pass professional exam see the questions on the paper as a spread of hundred your job is to just pick 50 and you have passed many students when approach the exam this way they just go to the exam hall thinking that ah oh, well i'll do the ones i can if you do the ones you can you end up not passing 
So please answer all questions. Answer every single question. Someone may ask, how do I do this if I am not um, knowledgeable in a certain topic? Then we come to a time allocation. The exam will give you five questions to answer in three hours. Each question is ordinarily, what, 20 marks. So convert the number of marks into minutes. So three hours will end up giving you 180 minutes. So if you want to get a minute per mark ratio, then 180 minutes per 100 marks will give you what 1.8 minutes per mark what this means is that you should not spend more than 1.8 minutes trying to get one mark if you follow this approach you pass to not get bogged down with the details for every sub question like this just multiply by 1.8 so for example i'll multiply my six marks by 1.8 to see how many minutes I should spend in the exam realistically. So my calculator, give me a second. 6 by 1.8 will give me 10.8 minutes. What this means is that all the plenty talking I was talking about with holding tags, um, vendor purchaser, exemption, I have just 10 minutes to do it. Or let's even say you're giving yourself an extra breathing space. You have 11 minutes maximum. When the time is up, move on. If you do this, you realize that by the time you stack to all the time allocations you've done, by the time they say stop work, you've attempted, you've attempted every question. Don't spend one hour on question two, question three, trying to get 20 marks because you will not score 20 over 20. That's the painful truth, right? There are some things you probably leave out. And there's this thing called, um, you know, in economics, there's something called diminishing returns, right? Beyond a certain point, diminishing returns will set in. It's usually within the midpoint of a question. So let's say in this six mark question here, by the time seven minutes have passed out of this 10.8 minutes, you would have acquired all the marks you would have acquired anyways, right? So you'd have acquired at least half of the marks. So if you stick to your timings, you remember something to write. When time is up, move on. Right? Please remember when time is up, move on. So stick to your timings for a 20 mark question. I've done this so many times, so that should give you, I think, 36 minutes. It means so for every, if every question is 20 minutes, I mean, it's 20 marks, you should not spend more than 36 minutes on a full question. When 36 minutes is up, move on. Don't waste time trying to write extra paragraphs. You are done. Move on. Right? Stick to it. And someone may ask also, then what about the ones I'm struggling with? Then the third advice is please answer your best questions what first do your best questions first by best questions i mean what's your favorite you know they give you 15 minutes reading time some people use that 15 minute, minutes reading time to look around look at their friends and look at what someone is wearing no that 15 minutes reading time is for you to go through the entire paper identify the questions you want to answer first and then if there are some tax rates you need to recollect, write them on the paper. You are allowed to write on the question paper, just you can't write in your answer booklet. So use that time, annotate it. Arrange the questions you do and do your best questions first. If you see a question on employment income with holding tag for those in level three, if you see a question on um, the extractive sector, mine, oil and gas, and you want to do that first, do your best question first. Everybody here knows what their best question is. You identify this when you're doing your studies. Right, do your best question first. What that does for you, number one, is that it gives you what? The confidence. You know I've done something good. You know I've, I've actually achieved something. It gives you the momentum to do your second and third and fourth question. The truth is by the time you're getting to your fourth and fifth question, your output will be reducing. Your quality of output will be reducing. Unless you're an exceptionally smart student who can maintain that quality throughout. Most of us, most people, by the time they are doing question four, question five, their quality will be dropping because they are not, those are not their really like favorite questions. So do your best in the beginning. Apart from confidence, what it does for you is that it gives the examiner, he begins to trust you. And as much as examiners will say they are not biased, if you are an examiner, imagine you mark a candidate's paper. First question, they score question one, that they attempt, they score 20 over 20. Question two, they score 20 over 20. 
Question three, they score 19 over 20. At this point, they've passed anyways, right? So they are 59, they've passed, even if they stop. Think about it like this, this candidate's question four, you can see he's struggling. Let's even say he scored 17 over 20. This is an excellent student. Then question five, you can see he's struggling. If you were to mark it strictly, you know that this candidate will get 5 over 20. But because you've marked four of his questions and he's so good that he's scoring perfect scores here, 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 and here, you'll be tempted to pump up or push up these marks. Naturally, it's human nature. Because you know this guy is good. It's probably something that caused him to falter. You know he's even already passed. And you are now rooting for him to become the best candidate in this paper with the highest mark if possible, right? So areas where he's having shortcomings, you begin to see, oh, this thing is written. Can't I give him half mark instead of giving him wrong entirely? You begin to compensate for his weakness as an examiner. So put your best foot forward. Impress the examiner in your question one, in your question two. So that by the time you begin to drop in quality, he, be, he knows that you are competent. But let's flip the table and imagine you are an examiner you mark the person's question one, he scores zero. A very terrible attempt. You mark their question two, even if it's good, you've, you don't really trust them that much. It's, it's human nature. I mark your first question, you get zero. You do something really terrible, something really stupid. In the second question, I look at your question and I'm like, ah, even though you are writing a good thing, I'm, I'm skeptical. Are you that good? Worst case scenario is if you score zero in the first one. Let's even say you score five over 20 in the first one. Next one is score 4 over 20. Your best question is now coming. Question, let's say even question 3, you score 10 over 20. It was question 4 and question 5 that you're about to show your powers. By this stage, he he's created an opinion that you're not that smart. So the favor he would have given the first candidate in his weak areas, you won't enjoy. It's human nature. It's not documented anywhere. That's human nature. So please, the advice for today is um, answer all questions break your questions into minutes so do not spend more than 36 minutes on a 20 mark question and answer your best questions first and one thing i always add is believe in yourself believe you can believe you're capable right believe you are ready for the exam believe you're ready to pass this thing and believe you pass right and this is not a faith sermon or anything i don't care what you believe in the point is the human mind once you make up your mind that you are capable of doing something it takes you a long way in achieving that particular goal or objective you've set. So please put it in your mind that you are ready for this exam. You are very ready and then you do whatever it takes to pass the exam. So on that note, let's let's bring day one to an end. Um, as usual, feel free if you have a question, drop it in the comments. Um, I will answer. And um, on this note, I will catch you on day two, which is on Sunday, Sunday evening. We will do employment income taxation. Very popular topic appears in every single exam so come let's do employment income let's revise all the things you need to remember all the rates all the principles all the exemptions everything and then we'll also do social security and pensions so tier one tier two tier three the special rules what has changed when it comes to updates from um, last year any SNET communication we've had any national pensions regulatory authority communications we've had we'll go through all of that on um, sunday so i'll catch you on sunday um, on day two of our crash course series so i wish you all the very best as you get ready for your exam and i'll see you on sunday enjoy the rest of the evening bye bye <music>